here we have an ECG taken from a previously healthy 20-year-old male with chest discomfort on inspiration. So take a moment to review the ECG, try to interpret it yourself, and uh, pause the video. And when you're ready, uh, start the video, and we'll go through this together. Now, if you want to follow along with this uh, interpretation, go to practice.ekgguide.com. Register if you haven't or log in if you already have an account. Register for free. Okay, and then once you log in, we're going to go to uh, this case. When you log in, you may see a dashboard that looks like this. And as you can see, I don't really have any performance, haven't uh, done any questions. And what you're going to do is click this practice cases drop down and click the, the weekly challenge. And there you'll find uh, the cases that we have for this week. So here are the cases. And we're going to go through this first one. All right. And the first one is. Uh, actually submitted by a friend and colleague, uh, Dr. Ken Grower, and so uh, we're going to look at that. It's going to be the previously healthy 20-year-old male with chest discomfort on inspiration. So we'll click uh, that start button to look at this. So to orient yourself when you log in, you're going to see that there's a time at the top that gives you 10 minutes for this ECG. Here's the patient clinical stem, the previously 20-year-old healthy male with chest discomfort on inspiration. You have the 12 lead ECGs. You have the different tools down here at the bottom, the calipers that you can use. And then here's the, the score sheet, the coding options, okay? And you can simply search the options uh, or any labels that are here, okay? So you might uh, click some of these labels, for instance, sinus rhythm, and there you can see your answer shows up. And you will want to complete your full interpretation. If you're looking for you know, any uh, option, you can simply search it here. And so if I was looking for maybe left, you know, atrial abnormality or enlargement, you'd click that there and you could see that. So you click that and it would show up. Okay. And so once you're done, submit your answer and then we'll go through uh, this ECG together. So after submitting, you can kind of see your score that you got. Um, <clears throat> you can see that the correct answers that are present, our answers, so the correct answers, your answers, the points, time spent, and your confidence level. Um, and there's a video explanation, uh, which will be there, and you'll see that. Then there's a, a full written explanation that we have. And so that written explanation is fully here, and you could read through that. It's detailed all the way from beginning to end. If you want to listen to it, you can also do that as well. Uh, and from the written explanation, you also have the related mastery content uh, that's related to this lesson and other recommended resources that we have available. And so let's go through this answer. Now, the other thing to note is if you're not sure what you know sinus tachycardia is, you can click it and it kind of gives you that description as well. So let's go through this ECG now together. So right from the start, you know, this is our 20 year old male. Now he has chest discomfort on inspiration. And what we see is a slow, fairly regular wide QRS complex rhythm with clear P waves present and some of which appear to be non-conducted. And so if we look here, you can see if we pull out the calipers, we measure the R to R intervals, we lock them in place. You can see that it's fairly regular throughout. Okay, if we were to measure that out. And so fairly regular uh, intervals here. We mentioned that we do have some P waves that are non-conducted. And so here are our P waves. This P wave seems to be conducting through. There's a P wave here, here, and it seems like we might be seeing one at the end of that uh, based on some of the other leads. So there are some P waves that are clearly non-conducting. Now the ventricular rate is about 42 beats per minute, and we get that by uh, taking pretty much, you can assume this is a 12 lead ECG, that we know that it's 10 seconds in duration. And if we were to count the QRS complexes going across one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and multiply that by six, that's an estimate of about 42 beats per minute. Now it's difficult to make out all the P waves, although we can clearly see two P waves within each R to R interval. 
And given that the P to P interval of the P waves seen between each RR interval, it is possible that a third P wave might be hidden within each QRS complex. And if this is the case, then it would make the atrial rate about three times the ventricular rate. And so we said the ventricular rate was about 42 beats per minute. If you multiply that by three, that gives you about 126 beats per minute. And what we're saying is that there's likely two here that we can see between each of these R to R intervals, and there might be one hidden uh, in the QRS complex as well. You can see that the shape of these are, are a little different than some of these, and they think that there might actually be atrial activity hidden within the QRS complex. All right. Now, the fairly regular wide QRS complexes suggest a possible supraventricular or ventricular rhythm. However, while the QRS complexes are wide, it does appear that all QRS complexes result from conducted atrial activity. The P waves appear sinus in origin, as evidenced by the upright normal P wave axis. We see upright P waves in lead two and the constant P wave morphology. And so if you look here, this is lead two here. You can see these upright P waves. And this is also the lead to rhythm strip that we can see them as well. The morphology is fairly constant with sinus rhythm, as we mentioned, in an atrial rate above the normal adult range. Now, this would suggest sinus tachycardia. Now, note that it is difficult to distinguish between sinus tachycardia and atrial tachycardia. Technically, atrial tachycardia would imply a non-sinus ectopic source of atrial activity, although there is really no way to determine this from a single ECG tracing. Atrial tachycardia might be preferred compared to sinus tachycardia given how fast the atrial rate is. And for this reason, we've given credit for both sinus tachycardia and atrial tachycardia. So either one, you know, if you had them both, we understand, and we've given uh, points for each one, okay? Now, in the sinus conducted beats, the PR interval is constant but prolonged, meaning above 200 milliseconds. In this case, it's about 440 milliseconds. There's also non-conducted sinus activity, meaning drop beats, and this is consistent with second degree AV block MOBIS type 2, presumably with 3 to 1 AV conduction. Now, what can be difficult to appreciate is the presence of ventriculophasic sinus arrhythmia, which tends to be more common with second degree and third degree AV block. In general, the shorter PP interval is the one that contains the QRS complex. The thought behind this is that cardiac perfusion improves following ventricular contraction, thereby resulting in slight shortening of the P to P interval containing the QRS complex. All right, and so what we're saying is that the P to P interval, including the QRS complex, is likely shorter in, uh, in that case. And so you can see that here, a little shorter than the one that follows. Now, the mean QRS axis in the frontal plane is within normal limits. We see in lead one and lead two, you have positive QRS complexes. ABF is also positive, so within normal limits. When assessing the delayed intraventricular conduction, meaning the wide QRS complex, we see QS complexes in lead B1. Okay, lead B1, you see that. You also see RS complexes, a wide S wave in B2 and B3. See that here, already merging into the rhythm strip below. Um, and you also have broad monophasic R waves in the lateral leads, V5, V6, and lead one. So you can see these, a little bit of notching there uh, in V6, as well as a lead one. There's no Q wave presence in the lateral leads, and taken together, these findings are associated with the prolonged QRS interval are consistent with complete left bundle branch block. Now note that while the markedly deep anterior S waves that we saw in V2 and V3, these ones here, um, they might suggest concomitant left ventricular hypertrophy. Although this is less specific in younger adults, our patient here is 20 years old, okay? And for this reason, we've avoided the diagnosis of LVH. Now, another clue supporting the three to one AV conduction and the on-time atrial activity is the subtle uh, deformation of the terminal portion of the, some of the QRS complexes by the hidden P waves. For instance, notice the extra notch at the end of beats number four and number five in the rhythm strips compared to the other beats. And so you can see that there in four and five that we don't really see that in any of those other beats supporting that there may also be atrial activity within there. Now the discordant STT changes, the, meaning the opposite to the main QRS deflection in the right precordial leads, V1 to V3, are off are within normal limits of the expected findings in left bundle branch block. Now if, however, concordant or you had changes out of proportion, the discordance changes, well, this could suggest underlying pathology such as ischemia. Also notice that markedly peak T waves above 
20 millimeters in amplitude in leads V2 and V3. And so that's these two here. All right, and so they're quite peaked, quite large as well, and that could suggest hyperkalemia. Now, in this previously healthy male, we would probably not diagnose hyperkalemia without additional information. In fact, this patient's serum electrolytes were normal. So in conclusion, how would we interpret this? Well, what we had for our final interpretation is sinus or atrial tachycardia with ventriculophasic sinus arrhythmia, second degree AV block, MOBIS type 2 with 3 to 1 AV conduction, and complete left bundle branch block. So this was a fun case, a lot of learning here. Hopefully you learned something. If you want additional information on this fascinating case, including the follow-up and whether this patient deserves a pacemaker, please visit Dr. Ken Grower's ECG blog, which has a lot of great information. Hope you learned something. Now, a question we, we sometimes get is, great, Anthony, I, I understand how you got through this. There are a few things I wasn't sure about. Well, again, you have the video explanation. You could read through the written explanation that we have here. So if you just simply click that, go through it. Uh, you could also click on the different things. So say you're, you know, well, I, I missed, um, you know, sinus arrhythmia. What is that? You can review it there. What is MOVIS 2? And as you can see, there's a point associated with each one. And that's based on cardiologies com coming together and giving us a consensus on what is actually clinically relevant. Um, you may say, well, is this appropriate for studying for my boards? Yes, we have probably close to 1,000 ECGs that are fully interpreted for you to go through. So this is relevant for boards built by cardiologists uh, for you. Now, there's recommended resources that we have here. There's Dr. Ken Grauer's blog. Uh, that's a great one. A lot of other ones that are uh, mentioned. And then we also have our recommended, this is related mastery content to this case specifically. And so say you're going through this, maybe you have the ultimate EKG breakdown, the first edition in the books and the course. Well, you can look at that. If you're studying for your boards and you want our coding, you want, you may look at, okay, here's the coding aspect. I want to check out you know, what is uh, second degree AV block MOBIS site 2? I click it, and if you have access to the platform, uh, what it will do is bring you right to uh, the platform, and you'll see a lesson just on it. So here we are, second degree AV block MOBIS site 2. You have a, a lesson that you can listen to, go through it, learning objectives, a lot more questions related to this specifically. So really a way to fine tune your learning. Our goal is really to make learning effective, efficient, and flexible. Right, and, and so maybe you already have an idea, you've went through a number of, of questions, and this is one way. If you have the question bank, obviously you can hone in and practice your skills based on the areas of where you need the most help. So hopefully uh, that's helpful, and uh, stay tuned for our next uh, challenge coming up in the near future.